Well, very welcome to the afternoon session um, in honor of Trudit Berling. Um, so this afternoon session um, is supposed to be AAR that is not AAR. Um, so we are all focusing on uh, topics around teaching and pedagogy, uh, interreligious and cross-cultural pedagogy. And I have um, the task that I found out very recently uh, to introduce this illustral panel um, besides giving a response. So that means I also introduce myself. It's a little unusual, but it's a conference for Judith Burling. Unusual is definitely not out of the ordinary. So uh, let me just uh, uh, introduce myself for a moment, and then I, I would like to uh, start and introduce uh, the speakers. We are going to have all the speakers are going to talk. Um, like 20 minutes, um, less than more, and, uh, and then we are, uh, there's going to be a response and then there's going to be a Q&A. Um, so who am I? Uh, I would say, um, I would start to say far, far away, there is a deep green forest full of dwarfs and princesses, ivory towers and Roman Catholicism. So it is filled with fairy tales and Schleiermacher. <laughs> no Judith in sight. So trained in political science, comparative religion, believe it or not, and psychology, I finished my theology here at PSR in 1995. I can't believe it. And I then happened to be very happy because I thought I had enough to um, plaster on the wall, I didn't want to study anymore, um, but my community, I happen to have a vow of obedience, um, said to me that they would like that I do a um, doctorate. And I didn't really like that idea, and then I said, well, if you push me, I push you. So I said, well, if you want that I do a doctorate, only in one place, and that's the GTU. And so they didn't understand that, and I said, well, you see, I have, um, have a, uh, had a little scent of it in 1995, and there is uh, somebody going around there doing something about interdisciplinarity, and I really want to do interdisciplinarity. So I contacted that person, then when I finally, you know, got the permission to actually do it at the GTU, and I'm sorry, not in Rome, <laughs> um, and then I had a meeting with uh, Judith Berling, and I um, came, you know, fully prepared with my interdisciplinary project. And so uh, I came home, and everybody was excited and saying, "And you know, everything okay?" I said, "I have no idea what I'm going to do." <laughs> Half a year later, I had a meeting with her, and. Um, it became much clearer, and I think I uh, am probably one of the most grateful people uh, for, your, uh, for your being here, for really having um, lifted up a spirituality, Christian spirituality, uh, as interdisciplinary and such a unique field, I have to say, in the world, um, especially as a Roman Catholic. Um, we have so much spirituality all over. Uh, and none is defined as interdisciplinary as here. So I, I really thank you very much. I'm the Julia Sophia was talking about. So you were in sabbatical when I took that seminar. <laughs> but still, I think I can um, say that I'm deeply influenced uh, by you. Now, I would like to um, introduce um, the first illustrious speaker. And that is um, uh, Courtney a graduate uh, of 2014 under the mentorship of Judith Burling, and she's actually a professor a little north of us at Oregon State University, teaching Buddhist studies and Asian philosophy, and she's teaching on interreligious education for the millennial generation. Please welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you uh, to Emily and Sophia for organizing this symposium, and Judith, thank you for giving us the opportunity to honor you. Um, oh, I need the remote. <laughs> We're going to go high tech. Thanks. Um, right now I'm at Oregon State University, but I'll be moving back to my uh, home state of Nebraska, Cornhuskers, and 
Um, I'll be starting the Asian Studies program at Doan University, also um, being an assistant professor of Asian religions. And Judith, you and I share a lot in common of being these Midwest women, right, <laughs> who leave, and then you come back to the Midwest and you are like this weird bridge and students say, oh, oh, you're like us, but you're really not like us because you've gone to Asia and you have all these interesting experiences, right? Um, and so for that, I was just reflecting on how much uh, my life uh, in, in many loving, lovely ways uh, parallels yours, and I really hope that I can be the inspiration to my students that you have been to yours. Um, so, to begin with that, uh, two years ago at Nebraska Wesleyan University, I asked students in my Religion and Philosophy of Asia course to acquire perceptions of Asian religions across campus. They needed to examine stereotypes, reflect on social networks that influence our imaginings of religious worlds. They also needed to reflect on their own views. To give you a sense of the results regarding Buddhism, Students said that Buddhism is related to peace, of course, <laughs> the symbol of the Tao, okay, meditation, Kung Fu, the Dalai Lama, Jackie Chan, that, quote, fat, happy gold guy at Chinese restaurants. <laughs> and my personal favorite, and somewhat I had no idea how this student knew, but Karma Chameleon from, of course, Culture Club. I've heard similar uh, students, similar responses from students um, when I taught at the University of Nebraska and as well at Oregon State uh, University. Knowing that these are prevalent over the course of a term, I strive to construct educational spaces where my students move beyond passively consuming such stereotypes and instead actively engage, contextualize, and criticize what is uh, or disseminated as Asian and or Buddhist. So today I'll talk about how my pedagogical method is influenced by Judith's approach to interreligious education, and I'll speak about how I've tailored her methods to meet my various needs. So I've taught within Nebraska and in Oregon in both the liberal arts and the large university classroom, and I'm returning to the liberal arts. So I'll share a few ways for students to dialogue with other religious worlds, techniques for drawing in the millennial students specifically, and finally, student-centered collaborative learning. At the conclusion, I suggest that engaged educational environments for interreligious learning fit well with our current creative-seeking, collaborative millennial generation. Prior to contemporary buzzwords that if you're on the job market, you will hear including flipped classrooms and active learning, Judith was already doing this. <laughs> she pioneered interreligious education, focusing on student engagement. She discusses that to cross over into another religious world, students must move beyond feelings of sympathy or empathy and instead begin seeing themselves as the other. Essentially, learners must ask the questions, how do persons express, live out, understand, and articulate meaning, and what are the behaviors associated with those imaginings? This cannot be accomplished by mere descriptions. Instead, students must engage the religious world in order to begin understanding sources and expressions of meaning. This, she says, is where interreligious learning begins. So many of us within the undergraduate context, we have our students visit local temples. And if you're not with, you know, an Asianist, you'll have them visit uh, other religious sites. But inspired by Judith's model of engaging religious worlds, I began striving to construct the experience to be active and not passive. From my experience, many temples have somewhat of a set agenda when receiving guests. The Hindu temple in Omaha, Nebraska, for example, has a 30 to 45 minute presentation that introduces students to the community, key beliefs, and has a guided tour around the main sanctum. The Leng Kuang Buddhist temple, which is actually, uh, you see the Buddha hall um, in this image, has a standard program to meet guests as well, um, to introduce them to Vietnamese Buddhism, um, and just you know, give this, them kind of the generalizations about uh, Buddhist practices. These pre-arranged programs are excellent for instructors, but they're too passive. They fall back on description rather than active engagement. When I first began taking students to Lin Quang, uh, shown here, I provided them with information on what to expect, how to dress, proper customs, etc. 
But I did, I did not do a very good job. <laughs> I didn't actually provide them with any tools to move across boundaries. Um, I, I didn't give them a task to look for, what to, you know, to, to investigate and inquire while they're in the Buddha hall. For example, if you don't know what to look for when you're in the Buddha hall, you're not going to ask, why are there so many Guan Yin statues above? You're not going to ask, well, why is, why is Shakyamuni holding this other uh, uh, Buddha in his hand? You're not going to ask those questions classroom models, which um, if you're in the liberal arts context, this is key for, for um, instructors to show that they're using uh, these kinds of, kinds of engaged pedagogy. So a flipped classroom is a blended student-centered pedagogical model where instructors try to make the most out of face-to-face -face interaction. So you'll have students perform and perhaps listen to lectures outside of class and then in class you enter into dialogue. Active learning tasks are encouraged to help students process and apply instructional material. Flipped classrooms have been proven to be highly effective for millennial students because the learning is innovative and interactive, just like our students. In reconceptualizing the Temple Tour, I flipped the situation so that students became participants and not mere observers. Step one is to produce a defined learning objective and determine how students are going to use or apply their learned material. My Temple Tour assignment now asks students to answer the question, how does any particular place become a sacred space? In order to apply learned knowledge from our class, my assignment requires students to locate the particularities regarding sacred space. I encourage them to further answer what makes this space significant to this particular religious community. What forms of expression are evident in this space and how are they being presented? The second step of a flipped model is to familiarize students with new material. For my temple tour, the new material is essentially what that particular Buddhist community presents itself to be. What texts are important to them? What histories? What imaginings? To investigate why the tour place is a sacred space, my students need to spend time outside the classroom researching the religious community. Throughout the term, they've gained familiarity with Asian traditions in general, and in my course on Buddhist traditions, specifically with Buddhism, probably far more than they ever thought they were getting themselves into, <laughs> to be quite honest. But that's okay. Uh, but prior to visiting any site, they need to research how the community expresses itself through social media, websites, new, news feeds, etc., as well as through events and activities. With this, students begin gaining a notion of how this community itself um, begins to understand who they are. This understanding accomplishes the third step of a flip model, that activities should motivate students to prepare for the educational experience. For my students, gaining familiarity does so. Steps four and five of the flipped classroom involve active learning strategies as well as ongoing learning. The purpose of my assignment is to provide a setting where students pr process what they have learned in the term. And it's in these steps that I pointedly draw on Judith's work so that students encounter the plurality of Buddhist understandings even within one single community. So I have them gain deeper understandings of constructions of sacred space, notions of the sacred in general, use of myths and symbols in religious life, and significance of rituals. While on site, my students observe Dharma services in the Buddha Hall. They also, though, then arranged by me, receive a guided tour, um, which again requires us as instructors to uh, be active in our communities as well. But they receive a guided tour in which you know, they can ask questions, they're able to interview participants, and then, and their favorite part, they get a meal. Right? So they love that, right? Because it's the best Vietnamese food that you will find, I think, probably in three states in the Midwest. So following all these exercises with their fellow classmates and me, they then share and exchange their experiences and also ask each other questions, like what did they notice about the community? What images struck out to them? Did they have any questions that someone else in their group could answer? Learning continues after the site visit, and then I have students work together in groups to prepare presentations. So while final papers are individual, then pre presentations are collaborative. So my use of contextual learning is obviously not groundbreaking, <laughs> because most of us use contextual learning. But I think this dialogical model has really shaped it. 
And what's been interesting to me as one who does a lot of ethnography too, is that I've, I've been able to use some of these interactions for my own work to talk about Buddhism in, in, in the West and Buddhism in Nebraska. So what's happened from some of these exchanges is that when we are having a meal, for example, one of my students um, was asking about uh, what the education process is like for young people within the Vietnamese community. And one of the practitioners said, well, at the age of 12 or 13, after they have passed through lessons starting at the age of six, they receive a Buddha name. And, she's, and she, the practitioner was assuming that most of my students were Christian. And so she said, well, you know how you have a baptism at, at infancy, we have a baptism, but they're 13. And so then it, it entered into this interesting conversation, and I said to my students, and we began talking, I said, well, in some ways that's a really interesting comparison. At the same time, really what she's talking about is really not like baptism. <laughs> and so it entered into this, this whole other space that I had never imagined, and it became this interesting dialogue for my students with practitioners and for those practitioners, it was an interesting dialogical process for them because they were having to, they were putting their notions of what it means to be Buddhist in, a, in Christian rhetoric, right? So it created this, this sense where we were all learning from each other, and it was a very fascinating um, exercise. And if I hadn't have constructed the model in this way, it would have been left to this um, audience kind of a notion where you have this presenter and you have a passive audience, and that's all your students receive. So drawing in the millennial specifically. So current pedagogical research is flooded with discussions regarding the millennial generation as active learners. Millennials respond well to lively class discussion, engagement with class material, and great creativity. At the same time, many of my students come to me used to being taught to a test. They're used to having Google answer, answers via a Google search seconds away and they still do expect that there is one way to get an A. And they want to know, they want to have a rubric to say exactly what that is. So this creates a great challenge because we have creative students, but we have creative students who have been told that there's one way to receive a good grade. And so it's, kind of, it's somewhat messy for, um, for those of us teaching undergrads. Further, um, what Judith notes is that in a discussion of interreligious learning, students encountering new religious worlds are already tempted to uphold um, similarities across religious traditions and tend to shy away from traditions that appear too foreign. Both situations prevent students from moving beyond the familiar into the unknown. I would add to this that from my experience, students are also likely to fall back on initial assumptions regarding other religions, and they are often fearful of taking risk and afraid of being wrong. They don't want to offend. And this also, I mean, we can spend further conversation about why this is occurring and, and the changes of communication that has influenced this, but because they're so afraid to offend, they're shy to ask difficult questions which is really challenging if you want students to encounter you know, an uncomfortable position and move into the strangeness of Asia. So I've seen this in both the Midwest and the West Coast context. I don't think this is a Midwest thing. I, don't, I think it's, a, it's what's happening with millennial generations. So what this means is that we must help our students understand other religious worlds, and to do so, we need to tailor teaching styles to meet them where they are. To enter a new religious world, students must be empowered to traverse the awkward path. My strategy taken from Judith is to act as a bridge and a coach. I encourage my students to take risks with their learning process. I create kinesthetic learning experiences to explain Asian philosophy, and I construct wildcard sessions. The first, taking risk. In her analysis of student-centered learning, Judith suggests that it is useful to create learning environments where students take risk. I have approached this in a variety of ways, but I think my current term has actually been the most successful. I think learning styles of millennial students are well suited to interreligious learning, and this is the most successful through multiple forms of engagement. This year, I teach an upper-level um, Asian thought course. I encourage risk-taking by allowing um, students to complete weekly reading responses in creative and artistic ways. 
Students have the option of completing a traditional paper, but should they so choose, they may express the teachings studied through an artistic medium and then accompanied with an analysis. This openness to learning has resulted in paintings, photographs, short stories, and films expressing the student's interpretation of the philosophies learned. And I have a few examples up here. Um, so to give you a sense, uh, one week, especially when we were talking about how the lotus is a key symbol within Buddhist thought of, you know, the lotus grows in mud but rises above, um, a student wanted to incorporate some of her freehand drawing, and so she drew a lotus. And while th that was more of an obvious sense, right, she then ha incorporated it with an in-depth analysis and then went further to talk about metaphors related to the lotus. Um, another student and talking about Matiyamaka, uh, Indian philosophy of the middle way, which is really uh, difficult to talk about because it's you know this, this tricky balance between nihilism and, and absolutism. She made a cup <laughs> at the top, so she tried to play around with the, the sense of a cup and, and colors and where does the middle way fall within colors and the sense of, but then also to relate it to the fact um, that the space of the cup, that openness allows as well for full expressions of what it means to be a bodhisattva. And she just went further and further with it, which, which was wonderful. Uh, so by choosing a non-traditional medium to express their understanding, a student takes this risk. However, by encouraging them to do so, I think students have analyzed Asian philosophy and manners exceeding my expectations. And further, they felt empowered to convey their learning in new ways. And as one student told me just yesterday, we're in week nine of a weird quarter system, <laughs> but as one student told me yesterday, she said, I'm so grateful to be able to express myself through art. My art has grown alongside my understanding of Asian philosophy. So for her, she sees it as this is a perfect pairing, that she herself is expressing herself and, and almost being like that lotus of growing amidst difficult situations. Not only do I encourage my students to take risk, I, as an instructor, have been empowered by Judith to also take risk, which is awkward. <laughs> But that's okay. Uh, in addition to oral and visual learning, I approach teaching Asian philosophy through kinesthetic models. For example, in presenting differences between the individual, static, true self, the Atman in Hindu thought, in comparison to the lesser, changing, false, ego self, I, alongside with my students, we play with Plato. <laughs> So I take a piece of candy, uh, ideally, and actually I did this with, with caramel because caramel is wrapped by, by plastic, so that's clear, so the plastic kind of represents the jiva with the caramel representing the Atman. Together it's the jiva, Atman, the soul. Just go with me. And <laughs> so this is kind of this, this true self, right? Then the caramel gets placed into the Play-Doh. And so every student then has a piece of Play-Doh that really houses a caramel, but they can't see the caramel, just like we can't see our true Atman because of this ego changing self, and we play with the Play-Doh and recognize that, will the Play-Doh form just like our ego self, it's all changing. So then we enter into this conversation of, well, when you detach, when you literally open up the Play-Doh, what do you have left? You have left the caramel, the, the Atman. So this demonstration obviously isn't perfect, how, but it conveys, it conveys Asian thought and, and philosophy that's really difficult to students. Um, as noted earlier today, students are coming as spiritual but not religious. That poses another problem. In some ways, actually doing comparison is sometimes somewhat easier because then you're comparing you know, Asian thought to something else. And so by um, giving them another means of understanding uh, philosophy, it makes it more real to them, and they're learning using other senses and, and using their body themselves. I also like, like that I'm demonstrating that I take a risk. Right? If we want to encourage our students to take a risk, we also need to take a risk. I like that it's playful. I like that it's creative. And knowing that abstract philosophical ideas are difficult, it's a new way to transmit teachings. Finally, to create casual settings in which students feel empowered to ask all questions and discuss any topic, I offer coffee shop sessions. Um, I do this to incorporate what Judith talks about as wild card sessions. During these meetings, there is not a set agenda, and my students lead the discussion. I have found that more students will come talk to me over coffee than they will to my stuffy, boring office. <laughs> 
right? They like coffee, the sense of it's, it's casual. They feel that they're, they benefit from the informal conversation. Coffee shops, hours, I still choose a coffee shop on campus, so it's still within the realm of academic settings, but it's a non-academic building. And we're exploring student-driven interests. And sometimes I, you know, come with ideas if they haven't, if they don't have any questions, but it's just a casual conversation. And I have to say that what happens then outside the classroom in these coffee shop hours always transmits into the classroom and students then talk more readily within the classroom. And in a class of 52, which is a large enrollment for a 300 level Asian thought course, you need students to talk. And so this way of having casual spaces, and I love the, the sense of the wild card session and students like that idea as well. Um, it, it has really helped in class learning. All of the above has introduced the ways in which I strive um, to create student Leonard atmospheres. In multiple articles, Judith writes about her experiences in decentering herself and empowering students to be co-learners and as well as co-teachers. To accomplish this is to shift the course's objectives, I love this, from what a professor will teach to what students will learn. And within the course of a term, the instructor's concern should not be merely providing students with their expertise of their own knowledge of the course topic, but instead helping students cross bridges to explore new concepts. In this manner, courses on religion and philosophy should thus not be, merely be about religious literacy, but more importantly about religious philosophical interpretation. To get out of the way of student-centered learning, the instructor must give up some control providing mechanisms for students to take ownership over what is learned. So in some sort of con con concluding thoughts, this is another um, uh, I just really talented students, I have to say, in my philosophy class. <laughs> Today I've discussed the ways in which my teaching is informed by Jewish pedagogical models and the successful outcomes I've found. I've left out a lot of the unsuccessful outcomes, but that's all part of the journey, right? <laughs> is, is learning what works well and, and celebrating what works well. Interreligious education involves moving beyond religious worlds, and in doing so, students also learn more about themselves and their own worldviews. When one learns about another tradition, the individual has the opportunity to reflect on what she holds to be true. This is really important, I think, for millennials because not only are they decentered already, um, self-reflection hasn't always been a part of, the, of many millennials' upbringing, and it's really uncomfortable and awkward, and so to encourage spaces to have those interactions, I think, is highly in, important. All of this, however, must be facilitated in manners um, that meet the student where she's located and must encourage students that taking risk is okay. Learning styles of the millennial generation fit the goals of the interreligious instructor well for both respect the particularities of individual learners and individual religious communities, while also recognizing the plurality embedded in both. In my experience, professors of religion and philosophy have great opportunities to incorporate student-centered education into their curriculum, which fosters students as lifelong learners, as well as conscious community members. My students who encountered now the Buddhist community, they learn to stand with their, their um, community members, not as participants and an observer or an audience, but rather as neighbors to teach our hyper-connected students how to move beyond passive social interactionism, as well as proliferated religious stereotypes, we are tasked with teaching them to be active. To do so, we must create spaces where students are not merely exposed to other religions, but instead engage and interact with religious worlds themselves. Furthermore, Judith reminds us that to foster student-centered learning, we must create atmospheres where all, where all persons in the course, including the instructor, are in the trenches together. This guides every class I teach, and I'm grateful, Judith, to you, for with your models, you still continue to be in the trenches with my students and me. Thank you. Uh, raise the awareness about, about politics or social injustice. But when I returned to Hong Kong, I realized that I'm a new immigrant. A city which I call home. Change, things change a lot. The students are more politically aware than me. And they are deeply involved in politics. But the issue is what? They close their ear, they don't listen. 
there's a strong tendency among the young people that they embrace white wing right wing values, anti Chinese, anti foreigners, anti old people, because they thought that we didn't fight good enough, so that they uh, to let them to fight this mess to date. They they thought that we are or we are too compromising. So I uh, I start to check. Uh, Think about my role as an educator, actually. I thought that I can share many things and I can at least show the way to them. But then, after the uh, Umbrella Movement, with my interaction with my students, although technically I try to, I try to uh, you know, promote dialogue, but I have to admit that the, um, the achievement is limited because they are not willing to listen. And the depression of the young people are serious. Um, I didn't go into details. Um, 24 students, secondary and college students, commit suicide since last September. In this semester, just ended in spring, I have four students uh, in depressions. Once I lost contact with her because she is in the GE classes, I have no telephone number of her, so I can only communicate with her, and he didn't show up. She only showed up once with tear in her eyes, that's it. And the other one, after a long while, she's able to come for final, but there's another two mentee from my department. Uh, Emily, you wrote me the email, say that you thanked me for using the night oil to finish the paper. Right after that email you, get, you sent me, I got her his email, two o'clock in the morning, saying that, he tried his best not to kill himself in the last three weeks. And two of them are now hospitalized and are in, uh, un under medications. Although they are now a little bit better, but I think this kind of depressions among the young people, the loss of hope, is a challenge, is an invitation for us as educators in general, as educators in religion, to show them that uh, although we may not hope for something very concrete, very giants or very promising, but at least we can hope for improving relationship among friends. Uh, one of my students come to me uh, about three months ago. He said, you know, where is the furious battleground during the Umbrella movement? I said, no, where? Mong Kok or one of the co uh, conjunction you occupy? I said, no. Home. They disagree, they, they, they unfriend their parents. They unfriends their, their elder brothers. They unfriends their relatives. Many students stop going home. So I think it challenged me as an educator, how can we address, talk about hope among this situation? Uh, not just talk about, uh, I'm not saying that cross boundary or uh, you know, inter-religious dialogue is meaningless, but I think this, social background draw us to into that kind of challenge we need to face because this is not just about politics it's about life and death of individual students um, I, was, I was lost i don't know what to do I, even up to today i don't know what what to do that may also explain why i share with judith this morning that i decide to come back because i feel i cannot do anything at all so it is my invitation, if you can share or cheer me up, <laughs> so that I can still at least, you know, uh, help to inspire my students. I was inspired by Judith, you know, although I graduated 11 years ago, uh, we have another relationship. We, we are dim sum gangster, okay. So she showed me her bookmark, less dim sum, right? It inspired me this morning. Uh, this is my last remark. I need to be the dim sum of my student, not to fat their stomach, but because the literal meaning of dim sum is, you know, to lighten your heart. So I think as an educator, we need to lighten the heart of a student who don't feel hope, who don't think that hope is possible nowadays in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good try. So the fourth speaker is uh, Joan Doi, a Mary Knoll sister currently in Chicago as co-director of the Mary Knoll Sisters Integration Program for new members and also teaching at the CTU. 
She taught at FST in intercultural theologies and ministry and previously served in Peru among the Aymara people. So she is talking to us about teaching and learning through the Manzana pilgrimage. Good afternoon. <laughs> so this will just be a backdrop slide. That's the uh, cemetery obelisk at Manzanar. Just a little meditation. And I'm gonna stick to my script, so I stick to the time schedule. So excuse me for formally reading this. Um, um, I have lived in Chicago for almost four years now and have grown to love and appreciate the Four Seasons. Once I recovered from my first winter of the polar vortex which local Chicagoans assured me was not usual. That first winter was life-threatening bitter cold, followed by a spring which to me was like a California winter, rainy and cold, so it felt like a seven-month winter, uh, my initiation. This year, however, after a very mild winter, I found myself enjoying the slow emergence of spring. It allowed time to really savor every blossom that ventured out, every size and color of the horticultural palette. After daffodils, tulips, and forsythia came the fragrant layer of tiny lilies of the valley, lilacs, irises, and apple blossoms. Coming back to Berkeley to celebrate Judith's retirement and contributions is a lot like savoring the beauty of spring. After a long and dedicated career in teaching and administration that no doubt took you through many four seasons, <laughs> and maybe a few polar vortexes, <laughs> Um, and you're familiar with this with your own Midwestern roots, which I really appreciate even more so now. Let us take this time, which we've been doing today, to savor the new life that you have empowered and co-created in our beautiful yet vulnerable cosmos. As my advisor and chair of my doctoral committees and a great co-collaborator with the other members, uh, Dr. Fumitaka Matsuoka and Dr. Michael Omi at Cal, I consider it a grace and blessing to have been your student, co-learner, dim sum collaborator together with your beloved partner, Rhoda, and most of all, friend, I thank you. Que emoción. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu, something I've just recently learned in my courageous Aikido practice at my age. <laughs> but that's a, a phrase that's said at the beginning of a practice the teacher and to the students one to another. And it, it has translated to mean, I am in your care. Please let me train with you. Please teach me. Let us co-learn together. And it also has a spirit of goodwill towards the future of the two, mar two meeting parties. I'm hoping that our relationship holds good things in the future. So this is a mark in a moment, but I'm still looking forward to it. course design and syllabus development. To a liberator. This process. Learning about Howard Gardner. So many circles and graduate studies course, even though from different starting points. Peru, you articulated the goal of empowerment for Strengths and we improvement. Students to discover their distinctive mode of and deepest goals. Their 
users rather than recipients of the banking method with deposit. Facilitating collaborative learning to see themselves and their colleagues as well as co-learners and connecting learning to passions and deep values and to or brave uh, and courage is my way of savoring what I To you, I lived many years in the southern sharing life and working they recognized and embraced me as another. to name visible and invisible to respond and in so doing to experience this expansion of love in Peru and a new heart of my parents and grandparents practice among the Aymara. Since creativity and through regular pilgrimage beginning in 2004 with this my own heritage by personal journey a return. Grandfather were detained. Shadowed ground, uncovering six. Scat Manzanar expresses the men. Humanity. It is not an escape like tourism, but a reason. And to memory. Re entering and recovery of history and recovery. Companions. I need to It wasn't simple. All in our understanding that these pilgrimage. I was invited to collaborate with. We Civil Liberty and Faith Project, which Deborah Lee was uh, teaching a course entitled America's Internment. Education pedagogy with adult learners and wondered if these practices Empowered, mentored by Judith. Promote relationality. It promotes 
engagement. Not only to release the memories of pain and struggle, but also those a class at 20 who came from very diverse ethnic experiencing the four phases of the pilgrim this phase it revealed a widespread woundedness Simply disappear, disappeared by this dissonant history. The commitment to journey. And to reconcile. What I had limited to being a Japanese American story was revealing itself as an American story, which has We re-enter into the chaos of suffering. Which made the suffering Second pilgrimage phase, Japanese American history, in motion, and the evacuation. Completion of ten quote relocation centers or concentration camps in remote areas of the country, often on Native American land. Time being limited here, I will defer to the many historical resources and Asian American studies departments um, that are available regarding the internment period. Uh, fortunately, there's more historical work being done on this now. And we were fortunate at that time to have living survivors in the area who were able to share their memories of their experience. We collaborated with two local historical Japanese American churches, Buena Vista Methodist Church in Alameda, California, and Sycamore Church in Albany, California. In sharing their stories and with respectful listening, healing and new learning happened for the survivors and the students. The commitment to journey to Manzanar and understand what happened continues to release that which has been shrouded in silence for many years, and paradoxically, brings new wholeness in knowing more of the entire story, which is still emerging. The survivors would bless and thank us for the journey we would be making. In many ways, the immersion and experiential aspects of the course began before the actual physical journey to Manzanar. Preparation also involved spiritual practices that freed us to temporarily suspend status quo or social markers in order to be able to cross a threshold and enter into liminal space and time. Simple embodied gestures in silence were developed, symbolizing listening, remembering, mourning, honoring, and sharing. These were invoked and practiced together at different moments during the course, in response to the survivor's stories, during classroom sharings, at different places at Manzanar, such as the gardens, the latrines, mess hall locations, the children's orphanage, and at the obelisk at the cemetery during the dawn prayer. Theological preparation provided a means to reflect on suffering, mourning, memory, and hope. The losses endured that cannot be recovered require the ability to mourn rather than be forgotten, compromised, or sacralized. The memory of suffering grounds hope as it counteracts nostalgia and historical triumphalism which causes forgetfulness or opacity. Metz writes, quote, resurrection mediated by way of the memory of suffering means the dead, those already vanquished and forgotten have a meaning which is yet unrealized. 
The third phase is the journey itself, which in a practical sense meant an eight-hour bus trip through the Central Valley, across the Mojave Desert and up the eastern side of the Sierras to arrive at the Manzanar National Historic Site, now in the care of the National Park Service. We made the journey with a heightened senses of sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell, our ability to perceive. We journey to a, quote, thin place, where the boundaries are more porous and permeable between the visible world of our ordinary experience and the encompassing spirit, sacred God that is present everywhere, though we often do not perceive it. Thin places is a metaphor that concerns anywhere our hearts are opened. Dusk and dawn, mountains and high places, music, poetry, liturgy, literature, the visual and theater arts are some of the many kinds of thin places. I would venture to say Judith's classroom was a thin place at very different moments. Certain people are thin places where we experience the spirit's presence. Serious illness, suffering, and grief have the potential to become thin places when our hearts are broken open by such experiences rather than closed down. Yet how do we rise with our hearts that feel simply broken from something such as the historical injury of internment? How do we collectively enable, empower each other, and journey together to name the wound, mourn well, in order to live into the process of transformation? So this is not a new question, Phi. From possibly, we're asking the same question then as you ask now. This is what we were co-learning, discovering, and experiencing together. We joined with over 700 other pilgrims converging during the last weekend of April for the annual Manzanar pilgrimage. The weekend involves a program of historical awareness, making the connections to be vigilant today for similar situations, and an interreligious ceremony that involved Buddhist, Christian, Shinto, and Muslim elements to honor the dead that evoke layers of meaning, collective memory, healing, and ongoing commitment of reconciliation justice and compassion. It is a journey that frees the pilgrim from all that prevents heart unity with others where we experience comunitas. There in the hot desert sun by the cemetery obelisk with Mount Williamson standing in the background, we gather to remember, to listen, to mourn, to pray, and to dance obon, the dance with our dead, with hope and gratitude for the imprints of compassion on our hearts. We literally encountered imprints of hope in the stone and waterfall gardens created by the internees for the contemplation of restorative beauty amidst the unjust desert incarceration, the unfailing stream of integrity and the flowing waters towards justice. Imprints of hope are birdsong on barbed wire, dawn and dusk at Manzanar, communion with the living and the dead, echoes of children's voices both past and present, youth reaching out across the barbed wire realities of today, elders and ancestors passing on wisdom and strength for the journey. The fourth phase of the pilgrimage process is the return and promise, and it is a challenging period. We are changed by the experience and come away with new wisdom and awareness, move to prayer and action. What do we bring back to the community? How do we fulfill a promise of social responsibility that was inspired on the journey. A Filipina student broke through the enmity of war by connecting the suffering of her people at the hands of the Japanese military with the suffering of Japanese Americans in the US during World War II. Many participants discovered friends and relatives who had been detained at Manzanar with their names on the wall cloth of 10,000 names and and confirmed by a cell phone call that yes, your uncle was there, but we just never talked about it. Solidarity with the Arab American community in the aftermath of 9-11 deepens as parallel connections are made, revealing the similar pattern, pattern of targeting those who quote, look like the enemy. Final projects of promise included homilies, radio interviews of church members who came forward with their stories of detention prayer services with images from the pilgrimage, solidarity projects with undocumented immigrants, research papers concerning the spirituality of social movements, the connection with the 1965 United Farm Workers Pilgrimage 
from Delano to Sacramento, which inspired the Manzanar pilgrimage. Native American layers at Manzanar, reflections on church on the bus and intercultural faith communities, lesson plans on the Manzanar experience, and for many, an ongoing commitment to participate in the annual Manzanar pilgrimage, as well as search out other sacred places of our lived experience. In conclusion, I share this poem by one of the students at the time, Michael Sepidosa Campos, a PhD at, here at GTU, and this is used with his permission. But life persists, it is relentless. Where terrain, though desolate, channel a people's spirit to hope deeply. To see beneath the veneer of discomfort, to claim life upon a land that has both spat and embraced them. There is stunning hope here. There is gratitude from which we draw life. We encounter the voices of our common ancestors. May we learn to see with their eyes, hear with their ears, touch with their hearts, and so hope as deeply. We remember and we are blessed again and over again. Thank you, Judy. So I'd like to invite you to stand. This is just a little pause movement break before um, Julia speaks. I just want to share the five gestures that we did. So I'll walk through them spoken, and then we'll do it in silence. So the first is listening, then remembering, and then mourning, and then honoring. Actually, I think you can give a round of applause to this wonderful panel. Um, and never enough applause for Trudith, <laughs> who inspired it. Um, so before we enter into the Q&A, I have been asked to be a respondent to these papers. And I was thinking that the particularity of my listening as a foreigner as a limited human being, and the understanding of each one of us in this room in itself is significant to what we reflect upon this afternoon, learning as collaborative conversation. Let me, in my particular listening to the presenters, lift up some aspects and reflect in what way they challenged me. Courtney highlighted how she wants to teach the students to see themselves as the other, so that the classroom becomes an extension of the outside world. I want to continue that thread. The classroom as the extension of the outside world is making praxis the foundation for theology. As Johann Baptist Metz would say, under theology, understanding theology as praxis is challenging us, each one of us, to always be concerned with the one who is suffering, as we heard it right now. When I heard from Judith for the first time with clarity, we are all others for another, a world opened. And I'm continuing that thread with Courtney's interest for her students, asking how our institutions support this foundations of learning. How do our institutions support that we are all others for another? Concerned about the one who is suffering. Do they support us? Which leads because it's hermeneutics with dialectics. There is no smooth meaning in a perfect hermeneutical glamour. Every true understanding is scarred by dialectical tension. That is the difference between conversation and dialogue, as Shikfai points out. Education is not banking knowledge, as we know from Paulo Freire, and Judith has um, again and again pointed out. But the task of hermeneutics, and hermeneutics have the task to remain open to dialectical questions. That is a question of hope. Let me show you a picture 
because that's how I teach. One click. Ah, I have a key? No, I don't have the thing. No, 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 no. No. Okay. <laughs> Let me show you a picture. Half dome. Just that one, please. Not more. Do you know it? Big monolith. Biggest actually in the world, of course. It stands in America. Has to be the biggest. I'm sure many of you took much better photos than mine. The half dome in Yosemite during sunset. Hundreds of photographers generally waiting for the perfect shot. You see the trees, the clouds, the winter air. A harmonious picture with a crisp meaning. Until I tell you, now please the next picture. It's a tiny little thing. There are no trees, no clouds in this picture. And the half dome actually was photographed by me upside down and the majestic monolith was a tiny little reflection in a water puddle of melted ice between some snow blocks. Questioning our frameworks. How we see, how we understand. Hybrid, mestizo, amphibolous, nepantla. To only name a few attempts to deal with interreligious, intercultural, intersocial existence. That is where Joan Doy was reminding us where are our thin places as educators, as teachers, as learners all our life? Those places that open our heart, how are we able to perceive the spirit indwelling in the space, in the person, in the text, in the arts? Different ways of understanding our multifaceted and multi-voiced reality. Joan shares how, shared how her teaching not only accompanied a pilgrimage, but became a pilgrimage, listening, remembering, mourning, honoring, sharing, and hoping. Like Courtney, Joan sees a difference between a physical movement and a journey. How do we embark on a journey? How do we not only question and move teaching set settings, but become journeys, co-journeys, and pilgrims? Do we have the capacity and possibility of silence in our teaching? As Joan experiences on the pilgrimage with her students, how do we find hope? As we were asked from Yikfai, how do we teach Islamic education facing Paris, as Reem reminds us? I would, find, would like to finish a short response with a reflection on what Joanne asks. How do we name the wound? mourn well, in order to live into the process of transformation and hope. As a German, I have never been able to do theology without the dangerous memory, as Metz calls it, of Auschwitz. That's my heritage. How do we name our wound, each one of us? Perhaps it is in the grayness and the non-clarity of memory and grief that collaborative conversation Interreligious and cross cultural pedagogy begins that leads into hope. May I see the next picture? That is the space where my own process of transformation begins. I never take pictures that are um, advertisement pictures. That's perhaps a thin space I can offer the students. It's the clouds, the rain, the unclarity, the mist, the grief, the memory, the fog, that makes us aware of life in its dimensions of journey and dialectic, of joy and hope, demanding the work of hermeneutics and reading the world as a multitude of text, unveiling in knowledge of the other, not about the other, as Judith often quotes. So the second picture, I would like to um, leave that for a moment, and then let us gather the questions you have on what you listened to. Next picture.
So we have like 10 minutes to be able to ask, comment. Um, I'm sure there's somebody running around with a microphone. This morning there was some uh, muffin offered. I can't offer you muffins, I hope. Uh, Quick, short response. The Finnish educational system, if you know it, and its relationship to all of your positions, did it effectively give you insight? Were you aware of it? And if not, does it pique your curiosity? Yes. <laughs> uh, for those of my friends who have young children, they often talk uh, about the Finnish Educational Society. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. Um, the sense of play as well that comes up. I've, how it's influenced my own teaching is I require my students to stand up and move their bodies frequently because I teach an hour and 40 minutes. That's a really long time to sit. And so I have them stand up and move their bodies and ask them to not just sit and play on their cell phone during break. So there's this, that's how it's influenced me, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, I'm interested. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, it was really very, uh, very enlightening for me uh, because uh, I also share the passion of education. And I'm, I'm, I'm really unfortunate that I missed out on your classes, Judith. I, I wish I could do that all over again. Uh, but when I, uh, as I was listening to all of you present about the pedagogy of education and the student-oriented way, I'm reminded of uh, um, how a teacher is um, a guide on the side and not really a sage on the stage. Uh, and um, I, I wonder if, if you've looked into the traditions, the religious traditions of how the prophets were perhaps the best teachers and, and the modes that they employed in, in gathering the flock together. I mean, as I sat there and I listened to all your presentations about what the pedagogy ought to be, it, it was just a reminder of all those modes employed by the prophets to be able to get their flock together. Uh, and it's just a, there's no question here, just a comment that I wanted to share with you and keep up the good work that you're doing and God bless, thank you. Thank you. Every panelist uh, added so much to my knowledge, so thank you so much. I'm uh, Tom Massaro, the Dean of Jesuit School of Theology. I'm only about one generation, maybe not even a full generation, removed from a time when, at least I'll speak for Roman Catholic theological education, was primarily about the mastery of texts, whether those were the texts of St. Thomas Aquinas or the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we still have these, or uh, papal encyclicals. I think we've made some progress, but not as much as I've heard here today. Um, I'd love to hear one or two of the panelists say something about how all of the themes, the rich themes about pedagogy that Judith has bequeathed to each of you uh, still is uh, reconcilable or maybe still in tension with the mastery of texts, that older understanding of what theological education used to be. Panelists, mm -hmm. one of you. Well, I'm speaking as a cradle Catholic, even though one time Judith thought I was Methodist, <laughs> which I take as a compliment. <laughs> but 
But I just found um, if you have the – oh, I'm supposed to speak right into this. There's somehow the, the period of – well, I don't, I don't know what I'm – it's the emptiness or the silence or the not knowing lead you actually to the experience of a deep faith experience that has been experienced over time. And, but you can now relate that. Maybe this is an acculturation question. But so then the texts, the mastery of those texts are actually, you can understand them as emerging from a certain context and actually understand them in a way because you've understood it from your context. So then the dialogue, you need the dialogue, but then you, the resonance can also happen. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't push away that text, but maybe it does contextualize it a bit, but also get at the deeper layers that you feel you can connect with. I don't know if I'm saying this, but that's what I've been experiencing with this. The question about text I, uh, from a Buddhist studies perspective is, is the same, is a very similar question, right? Because the history of Buddhist studies has been text-based and, and textual-based and starting with in interpretations. And so um, that's something that I've, I've grappled with as well of how do I have undergrads really encounter text and translation um, when they're, they're really difficult. And actually what I found in incorporating Jews model of dialogue is actually to put the text and dialogue with each other. And so, and that's been really effective, um, especially in the course that I'm currently teaching that, uh, you know, there's this great debate about Buddha nature with, you know, Chan masters in the Tang Dynasty, right? And so my students loved this dialogue between these, these Chan masters, and now we put, you know, Taoist uh, masters into dialogue and Confucius masters into dialogue. So we're using the texts and putting them into dialogue themselves, which allows my students to also then feel empowered to then also be in dialogue with the with the teachings. So that's one way that I've um, thought about this is using text in a particular way to keep that richness um, that's coming from tra tradition, but also then to make it more playful. Well, I'm not in theological education. Actually, I'm fighting against theological education in my department because they, they are too theologizing ethics. So, but I, in my context, I teach Chinese religions. I use Chinese novels, uh, myth, and on the Zen Gong An, Gong An, in order to push my students to, to realize that how much they carry into their readings. So that uh, they, they understand that text is not something just uh, uh, residuals or something from ancient and related to them, but somehow, even unconsciously, they, they engage into, with, with the text and they uh, project what they would like to, to see. Or, uh, and I, so I, I also try to undict what they try to hide <laughs> from their readings. So that uh, is, is the way how I engage with not Thomas Aquinas, but with uh, Zhuangzi, with the classic of the mountain and sea, with the journey to the west, as, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And perhaps just as a good hermeneutical um, response, how do we define text? And is it not actually about a dialogue between texts than rather a pedagogy of reading just a text? But a life is also a text. We have time for one more question. Hmm. Anybody in need of... Uh... So then I would like to show one more slide to give thanks to the next one. Oh, it doesn't come out, huh? Just the thank you to students, so if it doesn't come out. It doesn't want to come out, right? Very good. Okay. Thank you, Judith, for soaring like this heron, the GTU. Thank you. <laughs>